Pixelated Sculpture. This is a free broadcast from Xanadu Gallery. I'm your host, Jason Horsch, owner of Xanadu Gallery. It is Wednesday, May 25th. I'd like to take a moment just to welcome you all into the broadcast and go over some of the details of the logistics of the broadcast. You're going to be able to participate in a couple of ways this afternoon. Uh, first, you'll be able to watch a uh, slideshow presentation. Uh, for this broadcast, it's just going to be some examples of photographs. Um, you'll also be able to listen to uh, myself, obviously, and uh, several of the panelists that have agreed to join us this afternoon. Uh, and then you'll also be able to ask questions, and you can do that in two ways. On the right-hand side of your screen, there is a uh, question box where you can type questions in. I'll be able to see those questions. And, uh, and then we can respond to those. Um, also, during the question answer period, um, and, and also perhaps at various times throughout the session, uh, you can ask questions audibly. You'll be able to do that if you have a microphone attached to your computer. Um, and you can let me know that you have a question by clicking on the yellow hand icon, um, and then I can bring you in audibly. Uh, by default, you're on uh, mute. Um, I'll also mention that it looks like there are several of you who have um, logged on using the telephone mode. Uh, I would suggest you go ahead and switch to speaker and microphone mode so that you can listen to the broadcast um, from your computer. Uh, and then if you wish to come on and ask questions audibly, you can do so uh, when we get to the question and answer period. Uh, just by way of introduction for today's broadcast, um, several weeks ago, uh, we had a, uh, a similar broadcast on photographing uh, two-dimensional artwork, paintings, uh, prints, uh, and work behind glass, and that kind of thing. Um, and I always feel like sculptors um, get ignored in the art world, and so I wanted to be sure that we spent time talking about uh, photographing sculpture as well. Um, but a couple weeks ago during that session, uh, I had great uh, panelists on, and I felt like uh, both between the panelists and discussion uh, during the session from artists who were attending that uh, I got as much information out of it and, and as many good tips uh, as, certainly as I gave. Um, and that's going to be even more so the case during this session uh, because typically at the gallery we don't shoot too many photographs of um, sculpture. Uh, typically the artists are shooting those photos for us, or if we need an image shot, we'll, we'll hire a professional to do it. Uh, we're pretty proficient in getting images of paintings, um, but as you all know, getting good images of sculpture is, is certainly a little bit more of a challenge. Um, and so my intention today is for this to be much more of a discussion. I'll be relying more on the uh, panelists uh, for information, and, and I'll be kind of guiding that discussion along as we go. Um, by way of introduction to the panelists, I'm... Uh, we're still missing one panelist, and I'm hoping that uh, she shows up here briefly. But our first panelist today uh, is Dave Masterson. Dave joined us last uh, during the last session, so he's becoming our de facto photography expert. Um, Dave is from the Memphis area and is an independent consultant to artists on becoming more professional and helps them use digitally, digital photography extensively in marketing and selling their work. Welcome, Dave. Good evening. Welcome everyone else. Thanks for being here. Um, our uh, second panelist is uh, Chuck Rosen, uh, and I actually didn't have time to get a photo from Chuck, but uh, he is out of Texas and has spent a good many years uh, photographing artwork, made a living as a uh, photographer of artwork, and I'd like to welcome Chuck. Thank you for joining us. And well, welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much. And then we do have one more panelist, and I am hoping she shows up. Uh, sometimes times can get a little bit confusing. Um, this is uh, Marianne Hornbuckle, and uh, Marianne has uh, some great information for us. Uh, in fact, I'm hoping maybe she just got put into the general. Let's see if I can see you here, Marianne. Well, if not, we'll hope she joins us, um, but has some interesting perspective. She is coming at this is, uh, with the perspective of being an artist um, and photographing her own work, so has some good advice um, more from a do-it-yourself standpoint, although all of our panelists will have that, that similar kind of advice for us as we progress. 
Um, and so with that, I want to dive into our discussion of photographing your artwork. Um, and I want to begin that discussion by talking a little bit about uh, tools of the trade, if you will, um, the tools that you'd need as an artist to successfully uh, capture your artwork. And we had, again, this similar uh, discussion uh, several weeks ago in talking about the, uh, and hold on just a second here, yeah, uh, several weeks ago in talking about uh, photographing two-dimensional artwork, and so we, we, we may be covering some of the same territory. Um, but uh, let's start by talking about the, uh, the camera, um, and, and it was determined in our last discussion that uh, you don't necessarily have to uh, break, the, break the bank and spend a tremendous amount of money with a camera. Uh, but let's, let's go to our panel and see what discussion they would have. Um, let me start with you, Dave. What uh, suggestions would you have for a sculptor who's looking to uh, get a camera to use to capture their artwork? Uh, Jason, I'm of the opinion that just about any mid-range or prosumer uh, digital SLR will work. Obviously on your slide here we're showing an icon, but there are Canon buffs out there and Sony buffs and a whole lot of other high quality equipment available. I don't think you have to break the bank. I think a mid-range prosumer level will do it well. I have found that Seldom does the equipment limit the capability as much as the user's skill. So I'm much more in favor of skill and experience than I am for real high-end equipment. And, uh, you know, I, I know we had the same discussion a couple of weeks ago, but there's a lot of, of confusion among artists about worrying about megapixels and, and that kind of thing. Um, can you, can you just go over a little bit of the discussion we had again a couple of weeks ago in terms of, of concerns when looking at, uh, at those kind of details? Uh, uh, sure. Somewhere in the 12 megapixel range, uh, obviously the vendors are trying to compete and constantly drive that up. Uh, there's a bigger issue, though, of full frame versus 1.5 from the old uh, 35 millimeter days. And uh, that's where you can get a significant difference. However, again, uh, anything in the current technology range uh, will be enough to give you the resolution you need to get the beautiful quality in your work. Excellent. Let me, uh, let me bring uh, Chuck in. And Chuck, do you have any uh, uh, opinions as far as photographic equipment? Well, yes, of course. I'm, I'm a Nikon fan, but... Uh, what was said earlier is also true, but the only thing about the megapixel concern is is that it all depends on how large you want your final print to be. Because the uh, higher the megapixel print, the larger your print would be without any uh, uh, distortion or pixelation is what they call it. So you get a smoother print, the larger it is. So your megapixels determine how large your final print could be. And of course, for the uh, the vast majority of us who are using, um, you know, the digital photography, are, are are not going to be printing large format images. A lot of the times, it's going to an email or it's going into a uh, you know a newsletter website, uh, and maybe occasionally being printed to a postcard um, or, or even uh, you know a small poster or something of that nature. So, um, I guess what you're saying, Chuck, is that. Uh, uh, and Dave, that uh, at, at 12 megapixels, we should be pretty good for anything that we're going to be doing. More than likely. Uh, I've known some people who... Practical matter, I, th I think you're fine. Oh, well, one of the things, I have some friends who uh, have artwork, and they have been commissioned to panel large walls. A friend of mine is doing a tunnel system down in Houston. And, of course, she's an artist. Uh, paint, she paints all these things up, beautiful work. But if you want to do this, um, uh, you have a photograph of your uh, work, and if you have a, a real high image, uh, a pixelation of it, your pixels on it, then you could expand it to maybe do something like that. Something at a larger agree, scale. Most of the time, you're not going to get those huge assignments. But if you do, if you have a, a very high uh, pixel count, 
or density, then you can expand your work fairly large and take advantage of those opportunities. Yeah, and then going on to talk about um, other equipment that you might need, let's let's just spend a few minutes talking um, both about lighting and, and how you might set up your studio. And, of course, this assumes that uh, we're shooting smaller pieces, tabletop size and smaller. Uh, we'll also talk about uh, shooting larger pieces, uh, monumental pieces, and, and outdoor shots as well. But, but in terms of a, an artist shooting stuff, uh, tabletop size, uh, Dave, what are your recommendations for the kind of ideal setup, uh, again, without necessarily breaking the bank, but a, a good setup for the studio? Well, those of us who do a lot of it obviously uh, invest in commercial grade lighting. However, an artist is going to do their own work, uh, can go to a big box hardware store and get aluminum dish uh, uh, lights, uh, spring lights, uh, and stick 100 watt daylight bulbs in them and probably get just as good results. So again, uh, the issue is going to be in the execution and the skill of what you're doing more than it is in the technology. If you've got the money and you want to spend it and you're going to buy professional lighting, obviously uh, all the big vendors, uh, there's a plethora of that stuff out there, but you can do just as well uh, using a couple very inexpensive aluminum reflectors and daylight bulbs. And uh, Chuck, I've got a couple people who have said they're having a little bit of a hard time um, hearing you, so I'm wondering if you might be able to get a little closer to your mic um, or, or maybe just speak a little bit more loudly. But what, what would your advice be about uh, 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 an artist wanting to photograph artwork in the studio? Well, I, I agree. You need you don't need fancy lighting equipment, but you do need the daylight rated light bulbs that they have, the photo fuzz and such as this uh, geared towards uh, the light, uh, the daylight because that brings out the natural colors. I would recommend if you're doing 3D work, you need at least three: a main light and another light that's uh, about a third as powerful or further away and a backlight to light up the background to separate your item from the background. And your background could be easy enough. Uh, you probably you don't want a cluttered background unless you have a particular theme. But you could get these stands and drape a bed sheet behind it. And that would be your background. And you place your light so your shadows uh, can uh, bring out the texture and the dimensions of your piece. That's, uh, I think, excellent advice. And I, I will just say that um, looking a lot of uh, photography of sculpture, um, it, it's probably one of the more common mistakes I see that an artist will, um, you know, maybe just set the piece up on a pedestal in a gallery space or even in the studio space, uh, maybe not even thinking of the background. Uh, you know, it's again, it's not much of a problem when you're working with a... Uh, a painting because you can crop everything out, but with a sculpture you very quickly start to lose detail and things get confused between the foreground and the background. So I, I think that that is, is definitely um, excellent advice. Um, and, and it seems that the, the smoother the backdrop you can get, um, you know, in terms of not being wrinkled or creating additional shadows, the, the, the better off you'd be there as well. Well, that, and also with a background, though, you could use your aperture opening to shorten the uh, focal distance, the distance that you have a sharp uh, image. So if you had, had, are limited in the depth of the, where you're going to shoot, you open up your aperture on your camera. So you would have, say, an f1.8 would be your maximum opening, and your depth of field might be only about five or six inches into your statue or your three-dimensional work and you can't see it anyway, the back back of it anyway, so it doesn't make any difference, but you'll be able to see the front images and the curving of it. And Excellent. Background. Uh, let's talk a little bit also um, just in terms of, of the approach to doing it. Uh, we've already covered a couple of these topics in talking about the uh, the, the lighting, et cetera, but in terms of capturing uh, detail um, and kind of figuring out what are the best angles to capture, um, and, and then as I said, we've already talked a little bit about lighting, um, but 
But uh, Chuck, what would your approach be in terms of, of looking to capture as much detail as possible and, and to give the viewer of a photograph as much information um, from various angles? Well, it depends on the positioning and the density of the light and the detail that you want to uh, show from your sculpture. So you have to experiment with your sculpture and what you want to show with the lights and the placement of them. Because if, for example, if you're doing a painting, a flat surface, one of the things that's very important is showing the brush, brush strokes. But if, so you want the light to skim the front of the painting to bring out the, the brush strokes. But if you bring it too far into the paint plane of the picture, the brush strokes will be wiped out before the shadow. So you have to have a balance between the detail you want and where the light goes and the shadow that that light produces. Sometimes you need a second or a third light at different values to bring out all the uh, detail that you want in different parts of your sculpture, your 3D item. Excellent. And, and Dave, what is, um, what's your approach in terms of getting multiple angles of a sculpture? Well, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, if you're going to present them up on a website, or if you're going to a jury show, uh, the jury typically wants uh, at least three different angles on the piece. Uh, typically, they like frontal left and right, but that doesn't necessarily uh, make the best approach to get a, a true representation of the piece, obviously. So you've got to use some judgment there. But typically, they want at least three. Uh, even on bas reliefs, uh, Although they're sculptures, obviously they're closer to two-dimensional, but even there some of the juries want left, center, right. Uh, my inclination for a website is to lead with a piece that the artist feels best reflects the artistic element of the piece, and then move from there left, right, up, down, what, whatever is, is best from that. As far as angles, uh, background, and lighting, uh, all three of those are primarily driven by the nature of what you're trying to reveal to the audience. If you are a abstract sculpture or uh, do a lot of uh, additional stuff or expression, expressivism in your sculpture, then the lines are very important and the flow is very important. So you want your angles to highlight that, and you want your lighting to highlight that, and you want your background to support that. On the other hand, if you are high detail, high quality realism representation, then you really want to uh, use the same elements but to show the detail. And therein lies different uh, focal length and different f-stops. <laughs> Oh, excellent, and and certainly that uh, we could, I'm sure, do a day long workshop on on all of those kind of details, and and certainly we're not here to do that today. But uh, just in terms, I want to proceed to a couple of, of photos that um, Dave provided for us. These are images that he's taken, um, and and I wonder if you might just comment on what your approach was to to capturing these particular images. Well, this is done for a client, a very talented client by the name of Ann M. Moore here in this part of the country. Uh, the, the issue here is obviously this is bronze, um, very quality detail on it. And as you can see, uh, this is the angle that shows an awful lot of the horse, but sometimes a, a viewer might want to see it a head-on or obviously uh, from the right, a different angle. Uh, the issue here is on bronze, it's very easy to get hot spots and, uh, or insufficiently exposed dark spots on the piece. So this one highlights the fact that it's rather difficult to get good lighting without hot spots, but yet shows the detail. The background here is obviously uh, designed to not distract, but to complement to the bronze. Excellent. And um, I'll just scroll through a couple of additional images um, that you've provided where we're seeing some of that same thing. And talk about um, what are you using for the background here? 
Uh, I tend to use paper rolls. Uh, they're inexpensive. Uh, there is a variety of color available, and the artist can have a lot of input into what color she or he feels is most complementary to their work. This one is trying to show the lighting. Obviously, this is a dominant left lighting, uh, and the shadows are deliberate to try to give uh, the, uh, the viewer a sense of size and scale of the piece. Uh, the previous one was dual lighting, uh, primary, secondary, as uh, Chuck had said earlier. Excellent. And, and then in terms of, you know, obviously we live in an age where, uh, you know, we have some advantages of being able to capture the images digitally, um, you know, have instant access to the results of the shots, um, and, and then obviously start uh, manipulating them, processing them um, in, in a software scenario. Uh, Chuck, let me start with you and ask you, what, uh, what software do you recommend using? Of course, Photoshop is kind of the... Uh, you know, the industry standard, but uh, is it necessary for an artist to be using Photoshop? Are there other options that you might suggest? Well, one quality option is Aperture. And uh, that is a, uh, a very high quality piece of software. You have a lot of options to it, and it gives a great uh, image when you're finished. I've used Photoshop, and most of the time I could do basically the same thing I can with Aperture. So I would think that the choice of those two are my favorite. I know there's others out there. Some have uh, more tools, others have less, but those two have been my favorite over the years. And, and the, the only reason why I like Aperture is because with that, I get uh, it's easier for me to get what I want. And certainly it seems, um, and, and this is, uh, true of my experience with Photoshop, yes, there are a, a lot of options, and you can, can get a lot of control, but of course, with all of that uh, control comes complexity, and, and there's certainly a learning curve involved with Photoshop, um, and, and so in some instances, I almost think that an artist would be better served with a, a simpler option if they don't have the time or, or energy to devote to uh, learning Photoshop. I would agree with that. Uh, Photoshop is high functionality, high cost, and high learning curve. And for an artist who, who wants to shoot her own or his own work, that's a pretty, pretty steep way to go. Uh, philosophically, I will share that if you are photographing sculpture work, you are typically trying to get it on a website or you're trying to get it in a jury show, and you want the image to very accurately reflect the quality of the piece of art. You don't want to do anything creative to that image, and in fact, you can get kicked out of a jury show if the image is too far off and misrepresentational. My bias for, from a software is simply use something like Bridge or Lightroom, capture it, and do anything and everything you need to do in those more simplistic tools. If you have to move your image to Photoshop, then in my opinion, I didn't get it right into camera in the first place, and uh, I probably ought to go back and reshoot it. But if I reshoot it accurately, get the uh, coloring and everything correct on it, I should not need the power, the horsepower of anything in the CS suite, uh, like, well, anything, Photoshop or anything. Excellent. and. Um Talk about then, uh, Dave, what your what what adjustments you might be making in 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 the uh, processing uh, on the software side of things. You know, again, obviously, as you said, not 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 trying to radically change the image, but what would be a typical process for processing an image for you? Well, uh, to stay with a couple samples that we took a look at a minute ago, if you're shooting bronze. Uh, patina and the artist talent expressed in the patina, in my opinion, is critical to get that right. That's light balance setting. Obviously, that's driven by your lighting, by your settings in the camera, and then your post-processing manipulation. Uh, I always lock down the color balance in the camera. I do not let it use automatic. Uh, the reason for that is it'll always try to go to the 13 or 18% neutral gray, and it will distort the patina. 
Uh, so I, I lock it in the camera and then afterwards in Lightroom, if I need to adjust the light balance, normally just a little bit, the exposure is critical to avoid the hot spots, but yet to have nothing underexposed. And that, that workflow is typically get it right in the camera, minor adjustments in Lightroom, be sure the color balance is accurate. And Chuck, well, what would you add to that? Not much to that, because he's right. You get it in the camera first, and the processing is just to adjust the image that you have to, say, take out shadows, maybe take out a glare, but not for necessary color balance, per, per se. That should be done within the camera. But there are times when the light is not correct for the color, and that's why a, a good color processor a print processor can uh, uh, adjust it back to what it should be. And are are either of you using um, you know, when you take the shot? Or I, I, I'm going to show my ignorance here and not even know the right word for this, but the color bars um, that uh, you know show a spectrum of colors uh, to help color match. Uh, within the camera or within the process? Uh, uh, no, actually, um, you know, when I go to a professional photographer, often they'll just have a little card that they set out, um, and, it, and it gets shot in the photo. Uh, you know, it may have a, a, a kind of a light spectrum and then a color spectrum as well. Uh, obviously, you can use those tools. A neutral gray card uh, sets your foundation is really all you need uh, for sculpture. Typically, sculpture tends to have a very narrow coloration range. So neutral gray to get your benchmark is fine. If you want to use one of the other tools that also key to the rest of the spectrum, you can do that. But if you're not dealing with a calibrated monitor, it's a waste of time anyway. Sure. And let me, and then find maybe a final question in that vein. Um, after processing the images, what are you um, doing in terms of, of storing the images in terms of size? Uh, what, what's kind of your default setting for size, Dave? Uh, I shoot everything in raw to get as much raw data as I can so I can take it to maximize size if I need to. Uh, when I push it to a client's website, obviously we use much smaller uh, and typically, I go from raw to uh, output, obviously, in JPEG, usually three sizes, the small thumbnail, the mid-range, and the large, if it's going to a website in which the viewer can click on a thumbnail and, quote, blow it up, unquote, and see all the details. So typically, if it's going to that type of website, I store in three sizes. Obviously, that consumes disk space. You don't have to do that. You can just keep your one original, and then if you ever have to do anything with that image again, resize it. But uh, as a part of my workflow, I typically shoot it raw, output to three different sizes in JPEG. And just give an idea of maybe what the, uh, the small and the mid-range sizes would be. Um... Well, uh, if you're going to use one of the post-processing tools like a Bridge or uh, Photoshop or Lightroom or any of them, they all have a different method. You can specify it by pixels, inches, dimensions, or percentage sizes. Uh, I find for uh, artists who want to do their own work, percentage sizes are good. Most of the software will, will say, email size, small or large in a JPEG, and those are the three sizes that will work for just about anything. Excellent. And, and Chuck, your thoughts on size? My thoughts on size is to shoot raw, get as dense as you can, and store that. Once you have that, then you could do what you want. For example, uh, with the images that I shoot with my, with my uh, Nikon uh, digital, uh, small one, from my cam, from my uh, processor here, I could uh, get a uh, 16 by 20 print that is not pixelized and it's fairly easy to deal with. But if I want a larger one, of course, I need a denser image to go to the printer, so they could blow it up to a larger size. So for me, it, it depends on 
what the ultimate use of that image is going to be. And uh, let's let's talk about shooting larger works uh, as well. Um, and, and let's start that by talking a little bit about shooting uh, monumental size pieces uh, outdoors. Uh, Dave, what's your approach to shooting something in an outdoor setting? And I'm, of course, showing an example here. This is one of the artists that I represent where they've brought in, um, you know, obviously appropriate for the subject matter to bring in some children. But but what is your general approach, Dave? Well, I love the client or your, your work here on this one because it, obviously it includes the children and, and what a wonderful thing to reflect the artist's talent. Uh, and it also gives uh, a little bit of a sense of scale for the work, um, seeing it that way. Well, absolutely. And since you're doing a montage kind of thing, it shows it as well in a single piece. And it shows this particular piece that you're showing us, it shows us the project as a, you know, as a coherent piece. And that's one of the things uh, you have to look for in a monumental work. Uh, for instance, uh, the artist that I just mentioned earlier, Ann Moore, she also has monumental size pieces, and one of them is a lynx on a college campus. Well, when you do something like that, you want to be sure to capture the environment to give the viewer a sense of where this sculpture actually is in, this, in the setting for the sculpture. Obviously, what we're looking at here on the screen is a park or a very playful environment whereas a lynx or a mascot would be brick and mortar on a campus setting. So one of the things I'm looking for is context, but also enough detail that shows the talent and the artistic skill reflected in the piece. Excellent. And uh, Chuck, what, uh, w what do you have to look out for when you're uh, shooting outdoors? What challenges might an artist face? Well, outdoors, of course, you have to worry about the sun and the shadow and where things are related to that. And a very bright day out on the prairie, you have plenty of sun and you can shoot a lot, but I would rather have my subject matter in shadow because the light is more even, evenly distributed, and so are the shadows less, less harsh. Uh, so that is my, my preference if I have it. But bright yep. light is okay, and many times I've been able to shoot groups of people with the sun at their back and do a fill flash and come up with excellent shots that way. So Yeah, the, the lighting on this piece that you're showing us, Jason, is excellent. This was probably a light overcast day, hardly any shadows, beautiful balance. Uh, the patina in the work is showing well. The lighting here, to go with Chuck's point, is excellent. Well, and uh, to kind of wrap up our conversation, uh, let, let's just talk briefly about uh, reliefs. And, and Dave, you already mentioned um, shooting reliefs, but what, what special considerations would you have to keep in mind when shooting a, a relief piece? Well, obviously the artist's focus here and their concern is the depth of the relief so that you can, so the viewer can see how deep it is. It's going to look like a two-dimensional piece, but if we're, if we're striving for accuracy of reproduction in real life, then the depth of the relief is very, very important. So when you're going to shoot something like that, you want to use a, a mid-range f-stop, be sure your lighting is right to get the depth, and uh, show the thickness of the piece if you can. Excellent. Um, let me go ahead and um, open up for question and answer um, and, and uh, bring other artists into the conversation. Um, again, if you want to, you can go ahead and type your question into the question box on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, or if you do have a microphone attached to your computer, you can raise your hand by clicking on the yellow hand icon. I'll be able to unmute you and bring you into the conversation. Uh, at, from time to time. We do have technical difficulties with that, but we will give it a shot. Let me start by going to Richard Smith. Richard, are you there? Do you have a question or a comment? Up here. Yep, I can hear you, Richard. Go ahead. Okay, my question for the panel is about um, shooting glasswork. That is a real pain sometimes with reflections and all that sort of thing. How would you shoot glass? Excellent, and, and I you know, that could certainly extend from, from two-dimensional artwork that's covered with glass, but then obviously also you have glass that is sculptural in nature. Um, Dave, Chuck, what would be your suggestions in terms of shooting work that is, is glass? Well, one of the things I did 
it, uh, shitting glass is difficult because of the, the uh, glare that you might get from it. So you have to be very careful about the lighting. Normally what I would do is set up the lighting behind some uh, 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 baffles for the light so you don't get any direct light on the piece because if you do, you have glare. Secondly, I would use a uh, filter that would, uh, a UV filter that would uh, cancel out a lot of the glare that's there. So you wind up, if you do it properly with the proper lighting and spacing, etc., you would wind up with a nice piece of work that would show the engraving on the glass, which I have in my, in my files because I had to do this one point in time. And so with the engraving on the glass, the way I did it is the way I said, through a baffle and indirect. So everything would bounce into it and with a UV filter, which takes out the glare. Excellent. And uh, let me go to Kristen. Kristen Horde. Kristen, are you there? Do you have a question? Oh, I can hear Kristen. Are you there? And perhaps not. Let me go to, um, and I hope I'm saying this right, Abby Gore. Abby, are you there? Do you have a question? Yes. Wouldn't you say one of the most valuable tools for uh, the artist photographing their own work is a tripod? You know, that is an excellent point. And, and that came through a little on the quiet side. And, and the point was, wouldn't you say that a tripod is actually one of the most valuable tools you can have as a, a photographer? Uh, Dave, your comments on tripods and, and what you might recommend in terms of a tripod? Uh, yes, yes, and yes. Uh, especially for this type of work, you, it, it is rather critical. Uh, one of the issues that for artists that shoot their own work, uh, again, just like cameras, just like lighting, just like anything else, you can spend a fortune on these darn things. And uh, unfortunately, there is a price point under which uh, you lose the stability, you lose the control function you really need to get the sculptures photographed accurately. Yes, tripod is key. Using it properly is key. Using the levels in it correctly, using the ball head correctly, and using the level on a camera uh, is, is usually critical to get a sculpture piece done well. Excellent. Um, and Chuck, what, what kind of tripod uh, equipment do you use? Well, mine are usually fold up because I take them out, but they all have internal supports. Uh, so when you open up the legs, holding the legs up to the center post is another support from that. So that gives your tripod a sturdy one. Excellent. You can get very expensive tripods, but you can get fairly inexpensive tripods that will do the work. But you have to be careful. The less expensive tripods that you get, the more careful you have to be to set it up properly. So anywhere between, I, I don't remember, it's been a long time since I bought a tripod, so my prices are pretty <laughs> because The last uh, tripod I bought was about $75, and it was one of the top of the line, So I, and that was decades ago. Yeah, that, I was going to say that must be a few years ago. Uh, yeah. Another question that's coming up, and, and this is coming from a, a number of different artists, um, and that is speak to uh, lenses a little bit. Um, you know, there, there are obviously a variety of lens options available, um, you know, and, and a lot of times artists might be using, you know, kind of right out of the box, the, the lens that comes with it. What would your suggestions be in terms of lens selection, um, and what difference is that going to make in terms of, of capturing detail, et cetera? Dave? Uh, like the rest of the equipment we've talked about, lenses can cost a fortune or they can be rather inexpensive. I will offer, however, true to any photographer, what's going to tell you the most critical piece on any setup is the glass. So uh, the more money you can spend on a lens, the better off you're going to be. However, a lot of that money usually is reflected in speed of the lens. Chuck mentioned earlier a 1.8 lens. That's a very fast lens. That's a high-quality lens. It's a very expensive lens. If you are doing lighting with a tripod to capture bronze work, for instance, you do not need speed. So uh, a much lower uh, cost, a much lower uh, threshold lens would work just as well. Uh, 
I tend to stay in the mid-range of the lens. I try to use, if it's a zoom lens, I try to shoot the, the bronze or whatever the piece is mid-range in that zoom, not at the long end, not at the short end. And I try to use a mid-range aperture uh, to get a decent depth of field to show the detail in the piece. Excellent. And uh, I'm going to go, I think we have time for one more question. Let me go to Nancy Arthur McGee. Nancy, are you there? Do you have a question or a comment? And I may not have Nancy. It appears I not. Let's, let's try Lynn. Lynn Yamaguchi. Lynn, are you there? Do you have a question? And I'm batting a thousand here. I'll, I'll give it one more Hi. shot. Oh, there you go, Lynn. Hello. Hi. Oh, and I've got. Hi. Um. Lynn, I apologize. Unfortunately, your sound quality wasn't there for us. Um, we lost you. I'll go to James Kent, and if this doesn't work, we'll log out. James, are you there? Do you have a question? Yes. Thank you, Jason. Um, I'm just wondering if there's um, a standard positioning setup that um, it works in most cases for the lighting. That's what I always have problems with, uh, hot spots and so forth. I, I'm, is there a, a standard setup, you know, a left, a right, a center, or does it have to be customized a lot depending on the object that you're shooting? Excellent. Let me throw that question to you, Chuck. Uh, there, there is a, usually a standard lighting. The usual standard lighting is a highlight, one coming down from the top, another one from the right, about 45 degrees ang degree angle, and another one about a third the, the power uh, or, or less uh, at about a 45 degree angle. And that is basically the standard lighting. But then again, you could do all sorts of things with the lighting depending on what you want, moving one light source in, another one out, moving the angles to get the shadows, uh, having a higher highlight uh, image of brilliance, or move that highlight instead of straight up and down over 45 degrees or even o over to the right or the left as a highlight. So it all depends what you want. I've done excellent work with one light and a reflector. Nope, oh, and I... I may be losing uh, Chuck there. Dave, uh, I'll let you get the last word in. Uh, as far as lighting is concerned, yeah, the best practice is a primary, a secondary, and an isolation light if you want to use a third. However, uh, my advice is to remember what you're trying to do. If you're trying to emphasize the lines of the abstract piece of sculpture, the depth of it, uh, the smoothness of it, then just move your lights till you get the effect you want. If you are looking for very high detail, very high quality reproduction in a very exacting piece, then you want to be uh, uh, a little more careful of your hot spots. You want to be a little more careful of the left-right contrast because that's where the viewer gets a sense of depth. And that's why you, you don't want it balanced. You don't want it flooded. You need a primary and a secondary, either two separate lights or a light and a reflector, because that's where you get your depth of field and you really see the quality of the artist's work. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dave, Chuck. I appreciate you uh, sharing your expertise with us this evening, and I appreciate all those who have uh, been in attendance and your questions. Um, there will be a recording of this broadcast available on our website. Uh, should be up by tomorrow. Uh, I'll send out a link to that. Um, and we look forward to having you join us again in future broadcasts. Thank you so much.